You're listening to the Scarecrow Runner Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Gilbert, and I'm excited that you're here to journey alongside me as we lace up the shoes and journey through life, liberty, and all things running each and every week. Now, let's head down the trails and see what's in store in this week's episode. All right, thank you for joining me today on the Scarecrow Runner podcast. I have a guest with me that comes all the way from the land down under. It's Mr. Brody Sharp. And uh, so, Brody, welcome to the to the show today. I really appreciate you being on with me. Thanks, Anthony. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be on. I'm excited. Absolutely. And so Brody's got a pretty extensive background. Um, he's got a Bachelor of Health Science and Master's in Physiotherapy, Um Gosh, the certified professional in the running clinic, um, lots of different courses that you've had online. I know you have an ebook that's out there. We'll talk about that here in just a little bit. Um, you've got coaching qualifications with the Athletics Victoria Run. And then, of course, you know, uh, the secrets. And, I, you know, like, like I said, the, the book, uh, Secrets to Injury Proofy Running, Proofing Runners. Um, and I've, I've have started to read on that. It's great information, but, you know, you, you are. You got a lot of different articles and things out there um, for injury prevention and, and the likes. But the first thing I want to kind of jump into is kind of your background, Brody, and, and, and running and, and how you got into running. And then we'll just kind of shift gears into how that um, transpired into you going into the, into the path that you're in and, and being able to offer, um, you know, expertise in injury prevention. Absolutely. Yeah. It'd be nice to, to hear the story just so um, we can put all those qualifications into like a bit of a timeline. So I uh, graduated from physiotherapy in 2012. You guys call it physical therapy. It's very similar um, in the States, that sort of qualification. And I actually grew up playing basketball a lot. I didn't do any uh, distance running or recreational running at that stage and was injured all the time at basketball, which is what got me uh, interested in physiotherapy. And once I graduated in 2012, it was probably about two or three years into my career that um, I gave up basketball and my sister at the very same time wanted me to help her train for a half marathon. And she wasn't a runner either. And she is one that needs like a bit of accountability and like a bit of a buddy to, um, to train with. So I agreed and caught the running bug straight away and recognized I was working within a private practice at that stage. So just seeing any type of injured athlete or any, anyone with injuries. And so I would naturally see as soon as I became a runner myself and I would have a runner come into my clinic that was injured, I just had like this heightened passion to help them. Like there was just a, a different energy within the clinic. Like I'd want to talk about their running shoes, what running goals sure. they have, what their cadence is like, all this sort of stuff. And I was just buzzing and, yeah, this, this added passion brought out my better self as well. I just wanted to deliver the best advice and deliver the best guidance for them to get them back and reflecting that or self-reflecting upon myself. I'm like, I need to spend more time around this population because is what I'm so passionate about. And so ventured out from that, started my own online clinic. So it's online physio just tailored for runners. And along the same time, released my podcast, which um, sort of stems off when I was in clinics, I was constantly educating runners around certain misconceptions and a lot of beliefs that they have that might not be serving them, which is actually um, hindering their recovery or hindering their um, injury prevention, that sort of stuff. And so the podcast stemmed off that just a medium to try and help educate runners as best as I can with the knowledge that I have and the research that I have and that allowed me to delve into research, do these online courses, try and learn as much as I can about running, why runners get injured, how to overcome certain running injuries. And that's led me to today. So still continue with the podcast and blogs and social media posts and just trying to, yeah, get all these misconceptions busted as much as yeah, I can and just yeah. trying to provide a lot of clarity. There's so much out there too, because, you know, as we both know, you know, as runners, there is a lot of misconception and a lot of misinformation out there. And a lot of people, it's, it's because they don't know, right? It's they're uneducated. They don't know um, what's, what's truth and what's, you know, misconception. And even yeah. myself, you know, um, 
we, we kind of have a, a tie here, Brody is uh, I was a basketball player as well. Um, of course, oh, you know, there we being, go. Being, you know, being, being six, seven, you know, you kind of came naturally that that was my first, <laughs> it was my first passion. And much like you, I was always injured. It seemed like, especially towards the, uh, the ending of my high school um, career was, you know, you, you, you go up for a rebound and you come down on someone's foot and, you know, next thing you know, you're, you're laid up for several weeks because, you know, you severely have sprained your ankle and yeah, lots of injuries. And those injuries still plague me to this day, even as a, as a runner, because, you know, once oftentimes, once the damage is done, it's, it's hard to overcome it. But if you have the education and the mindset and the knowledge, you can make, life a little easier on yourself. Um, I know that, you know, I know certain things with stretches and, and things like that, that it's, it's helped me with my ankles to get stronger. And, and so, you know, it's just education, it's huge. And so that's great that, you know, you, you have the education and the knowledge and, and that you found that passion of something wanting to help people because, you know, people oftentimes don't know. And, you know, yeah. Can I add on to that as well? Sure, absolutely. There's, like we say that the runners don't know and it's not necessarily their fault because they're trying their best to look for the answers, but mm -hmm. the answers that they come across just makes it more confusing because I do jump on like Facebook groups. I do like type in, like if you search something on Google, what comes up and you, you not only get a whole bunch of different information around like, oh, you should foam roll, you should stretch, you should strengthen, you should um, release, you should ice, you should rest, all this sort of stuff. Yeah. So there's a lot of different ideas thrown your way, but there are a lot of conflicting ideas also your way. So there's like rest. No, you should keep running. No, you should ice. No, you should foam roll. No. So there's conflicting information, which leaves you a bit puzzled. But then you, if you end up going to a health professional, they can also steer you in the wrong way as well, especially if they're not runners, especially if they're not um, proficient with seeing runners and not aware of the evidence. And sometimes the the business side can get involved as well right. of them wanting you to come back and being reliant on that health professional to keep coming back for treatment. And that sparks up more um, puzzling sort of things because it, it makes you disempowered and you're relying on the health professional. And then you go to... Uh, say a shoe store and marketing is involved and <laughs> they're, they're wanting you to buy shoes and then things get a bit confusing that way. So it's not the runner's fault that they don't know. It's they're trying to find the answers and all of these influences are just creating so much, um, so much, you know, confusion, incongruency. Right? There, yeah. yeah conflicting weird. information because it's not saying one person's right versus the other person, but yeah, you have so much information and so many different opinions that it can become very, I mean, not even in running it's in, in anything that we research that um, it becomes confusing. So you mentioned one thing that I definitely wanted to hit on um, with the, with foam rolling. And I mean, that as many people and runners that I know that's cruel and unusual punishment in many different ways. I, you know, when I was running collegiately and even in high school, never even heard of rolling, right? We didn't do anything like rolling. It was a lot of, um, and here's another piece is like in, in college, you know, we, we did a lot of static stretching, but then on the flip side, I hear static stretching isn't good. And, you know, you're, you're, you're stretching those cold muscles and, you know, you start to warm up and things. You know, I'm, I'm guilty. I don't do a lot of stretching anymore. I, I wait till I kind of warm up and then I stretch in the middle of my run and do different things like that. But I never foam rolled before. And it's like now foam rolling is like one of the things you should and have to do because, you know, you got to get certain muscles, you know, especially like the IT band. I've, I've dealt with that issue many times. And yeah, foam rolling will put me through the ceiling because it, it just, <laughs> that pressure on that, on that. But yeah, um, there's so much information out there and it's like, you know, I grew up not having any of that and then getting into the running community. That's almost like those buzzwords. That's all you hear. And so then it's like, what's right and what's not right. Or are they both right? Yeah, I can help you out. Let's, let's break it down. Absolutely. So, let's jump um, into it. We can start with foam rolling. Okay. And again, like what I said before, it's marketing and there's a lot of, um, a lot of selling points with the foam roller and it is passed around a lot. Um, a lot of it is anecdotal kind of evidence. Like it's helped for one person, then they they become like a huge advocate. And we tend to be real tactile 
creatures. Like we love pressure. We love like massage. We love like touching sore points. We love stretching tight points. If something feels sore and tight, we love to stretch it because we feel like we're doing something. We're getting, we're, we're um, delivering some sort of stimulation to, to that area and feel like it's, it's helping. But pressing down on one point is not shown as evidence. They, there's a lot of um, literature around things like stretching and things like massage and things like releasing trigger points and that sort of stuff. It just doesn't hold up with evidence to get you better or in, uh, prevent injuries or increase running performance, that sort of stuff. It just doesn't add up. Yes, there are anecdotal evidence of people getting, say, knee pain and then they foam rolled and then they feel better. The body heals itself in, in mm -hmm. itself. But if you believe it also to be true, that also has a bit of a, a play and a bit of a placebo effect in itself, which is totally real. But when you have to stack up the evidence, there's, there's nothing to, to show for that. But there's, if you say, for example, uh, you used ITB as an example, the ITB is actually fascia. It's not muscle. It's mm -hmm. uh, this really thick fibrous kind of band that has no... Um, contractile properties is just acts as like a supporting kind of ridge to hold your your knee and your hips kind of in control and it is so thick and so fibrous that I remember when I was at uni we had a surgeon come in he said when they used to do ITB releases it used to actually blunten the scalpel that they used to operate because wow. it is so thick and it's so fibrous and you can't stretch that you can't release that because it's not a muscle and everyone thinks and says that they should be stretching their ITB and they should be releasing their ITB and pressing down with a hard, firm foam roller will hurt and mm -hmm. will feel like you're doing something. So in a way, it might have some placebo effect, but you're not doing anything mechanically. There are some muscles higher up in the hip that kind of attach on the, onto the ITB. You can stretch those. You definitely can stretch those and might make it feel better. But if someone in my clinic or someone that I see online does have ITB friction syndrome, there's a lot of other um, methods that we can do in order to um, help. I don't really suggest foam rolling. I don't really suggest stretching. Um, it's more around education, around training loads and uh, po potentially some gait retraining. So changing the actual style of how they're running. And um, yeah, we can delve into that if you'd like, but that's yeah. my blanket statement when it comes to foam rolling absolutely because yeah i i i can honestly say um brody that foam rolling for me has kind of had the placebo effect and doesn't really give me what i'm looking for it does not ever you know eliminate the issues that i've had it's just no it just doesn't do it i think i i do more pain and more harm than good because i'm, I'm putting myself through pain right rolling on um, that particular um big thick <laughs> not even muscle and so <laughs> yeah it's um i you know because in college you know we were running 70 80 plus miles a week right and i never had, done, had heard of anything like that and you know if anything you jumped in the ice bath and you soak right you soak your muscles and you soak your body in an epsom salt bath and i think i've gotten more relief from an epsom salt bath than i have foam rolling so yeah and that's that's exactly right and stretching is very similar there i don't i don't say don't i'm not saying don't foam roll but foam roll if it feels good for you but don't convince yourself of what it's trying to do similar with stretching uh i have there is evidence to show that well there's no evidence to show that stretching helps reduce risk of injury or increase performance or help with aiding recovery so that's a a big misconception that a lot of people have but i don't advocate not stretching i say you if it feels really good for you if you go if you stretch before a run and you feel really good after stretching then by all means do it same with foam rolling if you go if you foam roll your muscles before or after a run and you feel better after doing it um do it do a test yourself go for a run without foam rolling go for a run with foam rolling and see if you feel better with the foam roller and if you do feel better then definitely do it but don't convince yourself that it's healing you or releasing right. things or um, aiding with or preventing uh, injuries, that sort of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, let's, um, <laughs> let's keep diving. So gosh, I'm trying to think of a, of should we go for stretches? 
Yeah. I can dive so, into stretches a little yeah. bit more if we like. Um, um, yeah, because like, you know, like for me, you know, I, I've been in both worlds, right? Yeah, it used to be a, a whole thing on static stretching. We would stretch before we ran. We stretched after we ran. And yeah, there's times cer certain stretches that I that I know feel really good. But um, I, I've been guilty and, and not saying it's guilt. Um, I've gotten to where I don't even stretch before I run um, pretty much anymore. I go out and I, I start off real slow, real real easy going and just allow my body to warm up because, you know, as you get older, it takes a little bit longer to warm up. And through the first mile, you know, I'm slower, but as I begin to progress and, and increase the mileage, my body warms up and I feel great. And, you know, I do a little stretching maybe halfway through to ensure that I'm loosening things up and making things sure things aren't tight, especially on a longer run. And then when I get done, I might do a little bit of extra you know, stretching in my hips and the flexors and things like that, but I don't do a lot of stretching. And I know people will, will hammer me for that because, you know, they're like, oh, it helps your flexibility and it helps different things, but it's never really been a, a cure-all for me. Um, I, I've, I've stretched before, like I said, before and after running, and I do to where I don't even stretch before or after then with it now. So I, I've seen it good for both. Yeah. And I'm glad that you have this, you're telling this story because it's helping, it's helping me and it's helping like the audience because um, these are uh, common experiences that people do have. And it's similar to the foam rolling. Like if it feels good, do it, try a whole bunch of things, try going for a jog to start with and then try some stretching or then stretch and then jog or just try no stretching at all. But for me, like what I found is, effective for me i do stretch but i do maybe five ten seconds for each muscle group just before i head out the door i do just a really quick cuff stretch a really quick quad hamstring glute stretch takes me 30 seconds all up it's really nothing to um it, it just makes me feel better it makes me feel um a little bit looser and then i'm out the door but i don't do it because i think it helps with injury prevention or performance or anything it just makes me feel better and if i I'm doing say a, um, a faster session. If I'm doing like interval sessions, which require a little bit more power, a little bit more, um, speed, then I might loosen up my hips a little bit more just to get, um, to start feel a little bit better because I know I'll be extending my hips a little bit more through that range. But when you have your friends saying that, um, if you don't stretch, you're going to lose flexibility or you're going to get, you're going to be constantly tired or you're inflexible, that sort of stuff. When it comes to running, you don't put your body through end of range at all. Like you're not going to excessive amounts of range of movement. And if we were a dancer or a gymnast or um, a swimmer with their shoulders or something where we're working at end of range, I definitely recommend doing some dynamic stretches and just loosening up the joints that way. But runners, we don't really push ourselves through too much range that's required to do some stretches and if someone is constantly tight and feeling like they constantly need to stretch to feel better, I would probably question their overall like training intensity. They're probably training at too high of an intensity that are getting a lot of tight muscles and they feel the need to constantly stretch. And like we said at the start, people are tactile kind of creatures. They want to feel, if they're getting tight muscles, they want to feel that stretch. They want to feel that sort of tightness and soreness when they stretch a muscle, mm -hmm. if it is feeling tight. And I do that myself. Like if I do a gym session and I feel have tight muscles, I, I constantly want to stretch them because it just kind of feels good. You, you, you want that kind of feedback. And I'd question that most runners shouldn't be feeling stiff and sore all the time. And if they are constantly feeling sore, stiff, tight, all that sort of thing, I would question their training intensities. I would question their recovery. I'd question um, a few a, a few things, maybe sleep and um, nutrition, <laughs> that kind of thing. Absolutely. But, um, yeah, that's what yeah, that's I was going to say. I'm say. probably a prime candidate for that. Brody is, you know, I, I have, you know, a little bit of anti-inflammatory issues, you know, due to some, some, you know, a thyroid condition to where I have some inflammatory issues in my joints and, and stuff. So I often have, you know, pain and, and soreness more so than a lot of people probably do, but it's, it's because it's an underlying condition that I'm aware of. And it's not because I'm going out, you know, and, and hitting, you know, going too hard. Um, but, um, yeah, and also lack of sleep. That's a, that's another one. So yeah, sleep and, 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 you know, your, your nutrition and, 
and all of those things like you just mentioned, absolutely. You start looking at those things. If you're only getting four or five hours of sleep a night, yeah, I can I can see your body not getting the the recovery because honestly, you know, you probably need a little bit more than that for your body to truly recover. And then, you know, what kind of training are you doing? You know, are you doing multiple hard sessions, you know, day after day? You know, when when I've gone with my coach, you know, one day it was like I had a day off and then the next day was a recovery run. I'm like, but I just had a day off. <laughs> I don't need a recovery run. He's like, yeah, you do. He's like, you need to get your body kind of loosened back up and, and ready to go. And then the next session was a harder session and then another recovery run and then a day off and then my long runs. So yeah, it's, you just got to look at all the components. Um, and I, and I've realized when I don't have enough sleep and I'm not eating right. Yeah. My body tends to, especially as you get older, you, you don't bounce back as quick as I used to be able to in college where I could go on four hours of sleep and then get up and run 10 miles and not even feel it. You know, I can't do that. Now I get up at five hours of sleep and I feel like I've been hit by a truck. So yeah, Anthony, you've laid this out perfectly for me. It's, it's amazing <laughs> because, um, you're an ultra runner as well. Like you're, you're running high mileage. You've done like, you've put in a lot of miles in the past and mm -hmm. this is exactly what the evidence shows that the, the more advanced you are in age, the more the body needs time to recover. We need to respect that. We need to respect the aging process and prioritize the recovery. If you want to can still continue at that same running mileage mm -hmm. and same with someone who is younger, but wants to increase their running mileage. If they're, a half marathoner and then they want to get into marathons and ultra marathons and Ironmans and all this sort of stuff. I always say that if you want to train hard and you want to start exceeding all of um, your body's capabilities, you need to prioritize recovery as much as you can, as much as you can. And um, the evidence clearly shows that the older athletes do need more time. They might need, they, they can't bounce back as soon as what they did when they were 20. They can't go back to back hard sessions. They need an extra day, an extra two days. If they're in their seventies, they need an extra two or three days because the body just doesn't regenerate the same way it used to. And if you do recognize that um, you're trying to do the same mileage as you did two decades ago, or you're starting to increase and boost up um, your running goals, definitely you need to start paying attention to recovery and paying attention to sl the sleep, the stress, the nutrition. And um, my ebook goes into this a little bit as well. And so does my podcast that these have direct influences. Like if you lose poor quality of sleep significantly increases your risk of injury. Um, the nutrition side of things is still on debate. Like the evidence isn't totally clear, but stress increased stress levels definitely have some correlation to risk of injury. And so you need to prioritize these. And if you do encounter a daily scenario, if you like move house, get a baby, have a job promotion that is, uh, it sort of carries a lot of stress, maybe a loss of sleep, maybe a loss of sleep and increased stress in these particular weeks of your life, which are kind of unavoidable. Don't do your hard training sessions. Don't do your really intense training sessions if you're waking up feeling tired or if you you recognize that you have increased levels of stress or poor quality of sleep. Just back off the mileage just a little bit. Once you start feeling better about yourself, once you start sleeping better, eating better, better stress levels, then start ramping up the mileage and ramping up the intensity. And that's a lot better than trying to continue at a high mileage in that lifestyle, developing an injury and then managing this injury for a couple of months. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Cause once you get injured, it's, you're going to spend more time Stuff. and efforts to deal with that. And I would rather try to be as, um, proactive rather than reactive, right? That's, that's the name of the game. So what's, um, what's another big, big, um, injury, um, that we can, we can look at Brody that is best to try to prevent. I think it's worth because the, the listeners are probably thinking like, okay, these are all the things that I shouldn't be doing or the other things that don't stack a lot of weight. Well, what does hold a lot of weight? What can I do to reduce my risk of injury? What's, um, what's the best thing. And what I like to communicate with runners and like the number one message or the number one concept I want people to understand is the concept of adaptation, recognizing how the body can adapt and recognize what you can do in order to start increasing your mileage without getting injured. And most of the injuries, the most of running related injuries, the repetitive injuries are due to doing too much too soon, 
being overloaded. And most people can recognize when they do develop an injury, they think back on the le- last week or two and like, yeah, I know I shouldn't have done that. Yes, mm-hmm. I did increase my mileage. Yes, I did run too far. Yes, I did do too many days in a row, something <laughs> like that. They can usually pick a change in training or they can pick a really acute drastic change in things like terrain. Maybe they're doing hills all of a sudden. Maybe they've rapidly changed from supportive shoes to minimal shoes or maximal shoes or like the shoe type has dr- dramatically changed. Um, maybe they've had a really sudden change in like their running technique. I had a, a client who we just couldn't really pinpoint why he got injured. Um, he had a calf injury and I was trying to, have you changed your distance? Have you changed your speed? Have you changed your terrain? No, no, no. Um, anything else has changed? Oh, I did try and go from a heel striker to a, a four foot striker. Made so much, so much yeah. sense, a rapid change in his um, in his running style. So this is the majority reason of why people get injured. And back to the original question of like why people get injured, it's it's exceeding the body's adaptation zone. It's exceeding the body's ability to adapt. And when you go out for a run, when you go for um, a hike, when you go to the gym, as soon as you put your body through some level of load, it determines, okay, is this within my adaptation zone? Or is it exceeding my adaptation zone, which puts you at risk of injury? And our best efforts, what we should do throughout the week is try to hit that adaptation zone as often as we can without exceeding it. Because over time, if we keep hitting that adaptation zone, that zone itself is going to start climbing up and exceeding so that we are able to do more without getting injured. So that adaptation zone keeps climbing up and up and up and we keep following it. We keep chasing that adaptation zone and that's how we progress. That's how we get faster. That's how we get stronger. And that's how we remain safe um, when we do build up that mileage. But like we said, there might be circumstances throughout the week where there's low level, increased levels of stress or sleep or diet, which can also manipulate momentarily that adaptation zone. But um, this is the concept that most runners need to grasp in order to have a well-structured running program and a well-structured strength and conditioning program and um, start getting that idea in your head because that's why like marathon programs work so well because marathon programs like just slowly um, build up the Mm -hmm. mileage. They slowly build up your long run. They slowly build up the overall mileage. And then there's a few concepts. uh, There's a few components that I'd like added in there, but that's the general concept. We're slowly building you up and we're slowly allowing the muscles to tolerate more and more load. Yeah. And then you add in cycles and, you know, all of that with your different training programs. Cause you know, I, I started thinking, I was like, you know, for the longest time I would go hard and and run all these miles and just constantly running throughout the year. But then I start remembering back when I was in school where we had, you know, different sports like basketball, you know, we ran cross country, it rolled into basketball season, then track. And then summer was kind of an off period of time, but my body had time to, you know, recover and, and change of muscles and different structures. And then once I got into college, it was, you know, it was cycled. It was like, it was your, your strength training. Then it was your, you know, you built up and you built your mileage up slowly. And then you had your peak and then you tore down and then you start, you cycled back up. And, you know, I've been guilty. I haven't done that all the time. It's like constantly just, I'm going to hit this. And I know a lot of people that do it too. And I'm not going to name names because you guys listen, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know who you are, um, but there's people that go out there that don't really, really even have a training program and they just go out and run as many miles as they can in a, in a week or a month with no real structure. They just go. And and I know for some people that's fine. Um, whatever their body, they feel that if they're listening to their body, you know, they might run 13 miles one day and, and four the next. That's fine. Um, but I've found that you got to kind of have a game plan, right? Yeah. The joy of running is one thing, go out and run three to five miles. You're not going to hurt anything really. But if you're running a lot of heavy miles and you're just randomly, you know, it's like, are you just drawing a number to see how many miles you're running today? Because if there's no rhyme or reason, and you're going to put in those, those miles, your body's going to, unfortunately it has, has hit some of these runners with injuries. And, you know, I'm not going to sit there and judge them because I've been guilty of it too. But two of the main injuries that I've encountered with several of my friends and I know other runners and and as well as myself is, um, is plantar fasciitis. And, and then of course the good old Achilles, um, 
And I think I know several runners that have dealt with the Achilles, but myself, I've, I've had three different, you know, rounds of dealing with plantar fasciitis, you know, and I've done a lot of research and, and reading and I can attribute probably pinpoint it. And you probably would agree with me. Um, you may, may not, but um, part of it was, and you just touched on it, Brody, was in um, a high amount of increase in mileage in a short amount of time. So my, my body wasn't ready for that and then changing shoes. And so that was two parts of it. And then, and then of course, genetics plays into part of that as well. But, you know, I, um, in January, I started coming down with plantar fasciitis again. And I was like, no, this is not, this is not what I want to deal with. And then it, and it was all tying into my calf and dealing with, um, my, the tightness in my calf was causing the pull on, on the, uh, on the plantar fascia. And so, you know, I've kind of learned to adapt some different things and try some different things, but, you know, I, I have kind of pinpointed for my own issues was higher mileage in a, in a short amount of time. And then the different shoes and the different strike, you know, was causing some of those things to pop up. So maybe you could touch on some of those um, particular issues that are, are very, I would say, probably prevalent injuries for, for ultra runners. Of course. <clears throat> Can I maybe ask a question back at you sure. when you asked, when you were, changing your shoes um do you know what type of shoe you were used to and what type of shoe you were wearing at that point of getting plantar fasciitis yeah so the first round i didn't i didn't really have a clue what i was doing right so i just switched i was wearing um i, I don't remember now i changed brands and this this was this was a decade ago when i was dealing with, i actually dealt with it in both feet at the same time which was brutal but um most, most recently, it was after coming off of my, of course, I didn't, I didn't rest like I should have Brody after my, my hundred miler last year, as I went right from a hundred miler and I was starting to transition into some zero drop shoes and I'm used to five millimeter and, you know, it takes a, takes a while to acclimate to the, to the zero drop. And I went from running a hundred miler and five millimeter to changing into zero drop and running a marathon three weeks later. Oh God. Not, I don't advise that for any disaster. And, <laughs> and I was, I mean, I felt pretty good through the race. My legs were tired just because of all the training that I had done in the hundred miles. But it was the fact that those zero drops had caused the extra, you know, the extra strain on my calf muscle and running that marathon at a high, at a pretty decent clip caused the strain in my calf. And, you know, things started to, well, let's just say it, um, one thing led to another, right? So the calf muscle started causing me problems and then the calf muscle led into the plantar fasciitis. So I went from a five millimeter to a zero drop and then I went back to five millimeter. Now I have, I have introduced the zero drop back into my running, but I keep it to the short mileage just so that my body can, you know, acclimate to it. Yeah. And this fits a perfect pattern of what I see a lot. And people don't realize that a, a simple drop like a five millimeter drop it, for those who don't know like that's the stack that's underneath the heel like the distance between your heel and the ground when you're in your shoe sometimes it's 10 mil sometimes it's five mil sometimes it's zero mil it's the difference between the height of your heel and the ground and then the the height of your um toes or the the forefoot in the ground so that like different um comparison so those who change to something closer to a zero mil will have increased load in your Achilles, will have increased load in your calf, will have increased load around the foot. And sometimes what's accompanied with zero, um, zero mil uh, heel drop is less support, like the actual support within like in between the arch and like that kind of um, flimsiness of the shoe or really light not really that well um sturdiness there's less sturdiness in the shoe which can be great if you adapt for that type of shoe and what's what you're seeing is if you make that rapid change to shoes especially if it's more on the minimalist side of things which is it probably is then anything below the knee the the load through those structures significantly increases and i'll share the same experience i was running in traditional shoes um, within my first year of running and I was building up for a half marathon and running 15, 20 Ks, like very close to that half marathon distance. Then I went to zero drop shoes just to try it out, see if I liked it. And I struggled to, for four Ks and after four Ks, my 
Um, my calves had significant soreness for days and days afterwards. Thankfully, it was just like DOMS. It just um, it was just general muscle soreness that overcame in a few days. But I was super surprised that I had just muscle soreness in my feet, in my Achilles, in my calf, which makes a whole lot of sense. Mm-hmm. And I'm usually a four foot runner anyway. Um, but yeah, that's I share exactly the same experience. And if I was to push beyond that four Ks and maybe try 10, uh, that would definitely have caused an injury on my behalf. And that's what we see. We see a rapid change. And so when it comes to addressing plantar fasciitis, we also want to make sure that we're not convincing ourselves of other things. We want to make sure that we're not thinking that it's um, the, the injury has developed because of something else, something that you might've been told. But um, when I see my plantar fasciitis clients, I try and make sure I identify what, uh, how strong they are, how much the plantar fascia can um, build up because <clears throat> there's this concept, what I call the pain, rest, weakness, downward spiral and plantar fasciitis fits this pattern exactly. Sometimes a certain run, let's just say you're doing a 10 mile run and it flares up your plantar fascia. People get sore. They feel sore like their first few steps of the morning. Mm-hmm. It's like particularly sore and stiff underneath the, the heel and <clears throat> then they want to completely rest it. They're like, okay, it's plantar fasciitis. Let me rest for a week or two. I'll get back into running and we'll see um, how it goes. And then they try it again. And at five miles, then it increases in pain. They're like, oh, damn. And their morning symptoms are still worse. They're still tough. They're still sore. And then you rest again. You want to do to complete rest. Maybe your body needs more time to heal. You go out for a run again and there's pain at mile one. And you're like, oh, it's getting worse. Like what's happening here? maybe I just need more time off now, all of a sudden, like when you're on your feet all day, that starts to become sore. If you're standing like still for long periods of time, that becomes sore. Barefoot walking around the house becomes sore and you've stopped running because that's aggravating things. You stopped everything because they're all aggravating things. And what you notice over this course, this could be over the course of months and months and months is this pain, rest, weakness, downward spiral. When you, irritate your plantar fascia, the structures that hold that plantar fascia become temporarily weaker or like more sensitive. And that sensitivity means that you can't tolerate that same level of loading. So it becomes weaker. If you try and combat that with complete rest, it becomes weaker again. Therefore, when you try and challenge that structure to gym or walking or running, you have, you might exceed that capacity once again, which further irritates things which makes it weaker again, which means you rest it, completely rest it, complete rest weakens the structure again. And then it takes less and less for this um, structure to become sensitive and flare up, you could say. And so I I often see people with this downward spiral and then all of a sudden, six months later, 12 months later, they can't walk barefoot for more than 10 minutes without the plantar fascia flaring up, or they can't stand still for more than 20 minutes. And these are usually people that have careers around like nursing and Mm -hmm. a chef that has to stand for hours a day and it's really, really irritating them. So what I try and get with my clients is say, okay, where are we in this downward spiral? How much load can they currently uh, hold? And then we start some strengthening, we start some loading and we try and get them further up, climbing further up that spiral as much as we can with strength and conditioning and like just foot strengthening, functioning, all that sort of thing. But the further we are down in that spiral, the further we identify that you're in this spiral, the harder it is to claw your way back up. But if we catch it early enough, then it's easier to work your way back up. Sure. And that makes sense. Cause I mean, there I've, I've done exactly like what you said, where it was like, I stopped and it would hurt. So I would stop and I would rest. I would stop and I would rest. And I got to the point where I was you were nodding your head a lot through that story. <laughs> it was like a flashback. And I, I, I got to where I would stop and I completely stopped running because I'm like, I'm in complete pain. I can't even walk from one spot to another without being debilitating pain. This last go around. Um, and actually I ran my first marathon with PF in both feet and I just pushed through. And this last go round, I caught it early enough. I was like, I know exactly what this is and I know what it's going to do. And I'm not going to allow it to stop me because I have too much on the, on too much invested to just stop training. I just pushed through and, you know, I might've not just, I may have not increased my mileage, but I tried to keep it as, as close to what I was doing. And I felt like 
you know, because for me, you know, a mile or two miles in the pain would subside and I would consider it. And I know other runners have, I warmed up, right. My, my foot warmed up and I felt fine. It's the before and the after, which sucked. But for me, I tried to keep my training as close to what I was doing before I felt it flare up and I just pushed through and eventually it went away. And so, you know, it was about six weeks of, you know, frustration and, and pain, but I just pushed through and I continued to do foot exercises and strengthening exercises just to try to get, get that muscle and that, that area and that 10, that band, whatever you want to call it, you know, strengthened. Um, Cause the plantar fascia, it's actually, is it a, is it a muscle or a tendon? Or so band? very similar, very similar to the ITB, not as thick, but it's fascia, plantar fasciitis. The fascia part means that it's just like a rigid um, component, but it does attach onto a bunch of muscles. It influences its um, ability. Like you might be able to activate your arch. You might be able to activate muscles in your feet and there is, um, if you look at the anatomy, it is attached to the same part of fascia that becomes your Achilles. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a link between the calf, Achilles, plantar fascia, kind of wraps around the back of the heel. Um, <clears throat> so there's that side of things. And you can load the plantar fascia. You can load. It does respond really well to the correct amount of loading. And all the, the there is tons of evidence to show that if you do really slow, really heavy, really controlled plantar fascia loading exercises, it does help tremendously with um, overcoming plantar fasciitis. Yeah. And I, I also was thinking, because like you mentioned, you know, it ties into the Achilles. You start wondering, well, is this an Achilles issue? Because, you know, I've had, I've had the plantar fasciitis pain in different spots before to where I had it, you know, in the middle of the bottom of my foot, and then I had it closer to the heel. And so then, then you start to get worried because, you know, there's people out there that they rupture their Achilles or they have the Achilles tendonitis and things of that nature. And so when it gets closer to the heel, then I start to wonder, you know, was it more Achilles tendonitis or was it plantar fasciitis? Yeah, the, no, the plantar fasciitis is very characteristically directly under the heel. So like as close to the heel as you can get. And then on the arch side, like the big toe side, so um, as close on the inside of the heel. That's, that's the characteristic sign of plantar fasciitis. And I might just touch on a, a, a point that you made before around this warm up kind of effect that a lot of like plantar fasciitis and a lot of tendons tend to have um, tendons around the knee, um, tendinopathies around like Achilles. They have what we call a warm up effect in their Mo, mo, in most stages in the early developments of the pathology and it can mislead a lot of runners because tendons when they are inflamed or they undergo like a tendinopathy is what we call it. it's like a reaction in the first couple of minutes of running it'll be particularly sore and you might be limping a little bit and it might feel a bit stiff and you notice it there when you're running but two minutes five minutes ten minutes into your run it completely goes away and some people might justify this as, oh, I should be able to run. I'm pain-free running now. It, it, perhaps this is okay. Perhaps running is good for me. Perhaps running is good for this tendon. And sometimes that might be the case, but, but don't be fooled just because symptoms start to subside that it's, it's okay. What we need to do is pay attention to what the tendon symptoms are like once you cool down, what the tendon, what the tendon symptoms are like later on that day, and definitely the next morning because they're sure signs to see if you have negotiated that load okay. So you might do a five, a four mile run and the next day you're feeling like, okay, you're not feeling like a massive flare up. Whereas if you go for a 10 mile run, it could be pain free once it's warmed up, but then you're hobbling and crawling around on the floor the next morning because it's just flared up. And then you're like, what the hell's going on? I was running pain free. This is a, a, a surefire way of, identifying if what you did the day before was too much. So don't be fooled by this warm up effect. It's really important. Yeah, I, I definitely had that because, yeah, you know, I, I was feeling good during a run and then the next morning I was in pain again. I'm like, it's it's flared up again. I, I overdid it yesterday, yeah. but I didn't want to yeah. completely stop what I was doing. So it's kind of hit or miss. Um, so, so trial what's, and error, I like to say. Absolutely. I've learned plenty of it. Um, kind of like the IT band is like, you know, for, for a while, not knowing what it was, 
You know, I completely mm -hmm. shut things down because I was like, I don't know what's going on. I just, I hurt to run and it hurts. And, and I don't want to have pain because who wants to run in pain? It's no longer enjoyable. It's not fun. But as we both know, you know, ultra runners and those that run longer distances, you learn to suck it up and you endure through more pain. And sometimes that does more harm than good just because you're, you're not listening to those warning signs that the body's trying to tell you that something's wrong. But we also have learned that we don't listen to the little nuances either because the body likes to tell us, you know, every little bit of pain that we're feeling, you know, you need to stop because you're, you're in pain. But I'm like, I'm not going to stop for every little, you know, um, little amount of pain that I'm experiencing because I know, you know, my body, I know my body better than my mind thinks it, right? So if I'm going for a long run and I feel a little um, twinge and something, I'm, I'm going to pay attention to what's going on, but I'm going to keep going. And if it continues, yeah, then I'm going to stop. But I'm not going to just because I get that little nudge. It, it's like a it's like the check engine light or another light on, on the dash of your car. You, you see a light. You want to make sure that things are running properly. So you, you just pay attention to it. You don't necessarily have to, you know, shut everything down forever or uh, for a long period of time. Um, you just take more proactive measures. Um, and so, you know, if I start to notice those twinges of pain and things, I'm like, okay, I need to back this off or I need to start doing some more, you know, like for me, my core has not been as strong as it needs to be. And that affects a lot of stuff within the running aspect because my core is weak and then my hips tie into different things and I'm like, everything connects into everything. And so I'm like, yep, I need to start doing more core work because my chiropractor was like, your core is weak and your hips are weak. And so you need to build those up so that you can ensure that your knees and your ankles and everything else, you know, feel good. Um, so Brody, I wanted to ask you one more um, I guess another injury or another issue that you deal with on a regular basis that with runners um, that is pretty common on and some of the things that we might be able to do um, for the listeners to help them either overcome it or, you know, be proactive and prevent it. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Achilles. We can talk about Achilles or a common one that I often see is um, like knee pain, like kneecap pain, um, whichever one you want to delve into. Yeah, let's do kneecap pain. Cause I know, I, I know my sister has dealt with that and I know some other, other runners that have dealt with that. So yeah, let's jump, let's jump into that one. Yeah. I, I like that. Cause there's a lot of misconceptions around this. Um, this is called patellofemoral pain. So this kneecap pain, there's a lot of different running injuries around the knee, but if it is this certain diagnosis. Um, this is what we're mainly talking about. And it's the most common knee injury for runners. And it can be described as pain around the kneecap, quite hard to localize. You sort of, you can't pinpoint it with one finger. You can't say this is where it's sore. You kind of like drag your finger around the half ridge of the kneecap or something like that. It's really tough to describe where the pain's located. When I first graduated from uni, um, this injury had a lot of, um, selling points they were saying okay it's influenced because your kneecap itself is floating bits of bone like it's not connected to any other joint it's influenced by tendons it's influenced by muscles and ligaments that attach onto this floating bit of bone and what they originally thought was that patellofemoral pain is due to tight structures or weak structures around that attach onto the kneecap and that um, changes the position of it, the kneecap slightly and therefore uh, starts to produce this kneecap pain and for treatment what they said was we need to strengthen what is weak we need to release what is tight therefore that kneecap floats back into the position that it's meant to and away we go and we did that with taping we did that with dry needling with massage release with all this sort of trigger point release and um, kind of made things better but wasn't really that effective in the long term it helped settle down pain but didn't really help with long-term solutions what we now know and what a lot this misconception that still carries into clinics today is that this patellofemoral pain is mainly due to a spike in load, just like any other injury, just like your plantar fasciitis, just like the Achilles. There's a sudden change in something. There's a rapid change in something. There's it's doing too much too soon, or it's not focusing on your recovery and um, sleep, nutrition, that kind of thing. And so what we need to do it for a long-term recovery is to build up the load that 
the the kneecap and the knee joint itself needs to it needs to get stronger in order to tolerate the loads that you want to do so that might be an ultra marathon that might be a marathon that might be 10 miles something like that um, but also pay attention to your terrain and if you are doing too many hills going uphill puts a significant amount of load through your uh, the knee joint the kneecap joint itself then running on flats um, so being creative around building up the strength, being creative around how we're going to program your running program and coming up with creative ways to strengthen up the knee to not, uh, to avoid these spikes in load and then just take from there. And some really nice strengthening exercises could be things like lunges, could be things like squats, really, really simple stuff, but loading tends to help to tends to be really effective. And as long as, we're not exceeding the um, the tolerance and we're not creating more and more sensitivity. So we just pay attention to symptoms. Might be doing 50 body weight squats and then just seeing what your symptoms are like during, after the next day. And if that's fine, okay, let's try jogging five miles. Let's see how that is. Let's see how it is after the run, during the run, the next day. If we're all ticking the boxes this way, then we start working at our way up we start increasing the weight for our squats we start increasing the distance for our running we be cautious around running uphill and we just slowly build up from there and it's it's quite simple like sometimes physiotherapy could be quite simple but it requires the right education on the forefront and it it's not helping you if if you go to a therapist and they say oh you're kneecap is floating to the right we need to release the itb in order to float it back to the center um because it's just creating a lot of worry it's creating a lot of oh my body's letting me down right and there's a whole bunch of oh, my itb is too too tight what can i do to release that and like it's disempowering and it's putting a lot of power in the therapist to release constantly release and um change your biomechanics and it's not not the case at all and so that's what can lead to a lot of issues down the track because you've instilled these beliefs that my body's letting me down. I have poor biomechanics. I have this floating knee that goes off in, in another direction, which is causing the pain. And these beliefs trigger a lot of pain and it creates a lot of worry and fear, which is never a good thing when it comes to long-term recovery. Yeah. I had that to where I had someone telling me that um, it wasn't the kneecap, but it was the, uh, the good old tear teardrop shape um, muscle that's in our quad meniscus. Yes. And so oh, that, that one, yep. Yep. You, you've got a weak muscle here that pulls over here. Yep. And I was like, what? I was like, what are you talking about? I have strong quads. And so I started researching yep. and I started doing my own research and, and looking into different strengthening exercises and just working on different exercises to help build that up. And you know what? It went away. And I'll, you know, as, as we both yeah, know, you're building up the load, you're building up the strength. And a lot of times, you know, it's, it's like it's the, the placebo effect too. You get a lot of stuff in your head thinking, th like you said, your body, your body's letting you down. So you start thinking that, and then it becomes a reality because that's what you're thinking. And you become self-dependent on that um, chiropractor, whoever it might be, that's telling you these things. And then, you know, you, you become so dependent on that, that you believe everything that they're saying. And it becomes a vicious cycle. And I'm like, you know, I don't want to go have to go to the doctor if I don't have to. I don't want to have to go to a physical therapist if I don't have to. Um, the body is an amazing thing. And a, in most cases, the body will heal itself over time. And because I've, I've, I can say that because I've, I've done that. I've felt that. And my body has recovered in a lot of different ways. Um, but yeah, we just got to learn not to be so dependent on what others say and you know, it's, it's good to be educated. And so speaking of that, Brody, I wanted yeah. to kind of jump in. I'm here for just a moment on, on your ebook, the universal principles to overcoming any running injury. Um, kind of what got you into um, creating the ebook and, you know, kind of give us a, just a high level of what, um, what someone could expect if they were to read this. Yeah, sure. Um, the ebook stemmed from like this topic today. There's a lot of floating misconceptions out there and that's not serving people and it's hindering their recovery. And so I wanted to do something about it. The podcast being one of those and the ebook being the next thing, just in case people like reading rather than listening. And there's 10 chapters and each chapter contains a key concept and a key lesson that every runner needs to know when it comes to uh, why you get injured and how to recover. 
and a lot of the topics that we discussed today are within this ebook mm -hmm. and to keep it entertaining it follows this parable of this injury prone pete is the character within this book um this, it's like it's maybe 12 pages 13 pages like it takes you 20 minutes to read if, yeah. if that and injury prone pete like gets injured or he becomes a runner gets injured trains for a marathon does all this and like learns these 10 lessons along the way and this injury prone pete is kind of a character that i've developed based on all the runners that i've seen over the years and all the mistakes that they've made over the years and all the lessons that they need to learn over the years so a lot of people read this book and say oh my god i'm injury prone pete i swear to god you've wrote this about me and i know i say yes because i see like runners all the time and they come in with the same things and they come in with the same questions the same frustrations the same injuries and these are the the lessons they need to know and if you're not an ebook reader and if you're you like listening to podcasts which i'm uh, i assume you do because you're listening to this uh i have in my podcast the run smarter podcast the first 10 episodes of my podcast are every chapter within the ebook and we kind of discuss the the chapter and we kind of go into a bit more detail in the podcast episode and we just go through it we go through what injury prone pete's up to that episode and what we need to learn from it and we take it from there and then it carries on really nicely into the rest of my podcast, which breaks down a lot of other myths and misconceptions along the way and how to overcome plantar fasciitis and Achilles and shin splints and all this sort of stuff. But then um, for confirmation, also interviewing a lot of researchers, interviewing a lot of health professionals that are very proficient with the latest research so that you're not just listening to me, you're listening to all the others right. that um, are familiar with the, the evidence. And we can't blame other health professionals. Like you are saying with your Cairo because this is the stuff I learned when I first graduated that we need to strengthen the little VMO muscle that attaches onto your, your kneecap because um, that's what's influencing the control of your kneecap. We all learn this at uni and it takes a long time for the research to um, make a statement to change people's beliefs, but it takes so long to for that to ripple out into unis, for that mm -hmm. to ripple out into private practice, for that to ripple out into everyday consciousness um it usually takes around 20 years from once it's been published to become like you know common practice and, yeah, and as that's we just both way know, too long um you know we our technology advances and and gets better and then things are rapidly changing and so the stuff that you learn you know the stuff that was in textbooks and stuff from 20 years ago a lot of it is irrelevant because things have changed and we've progressed and we've learned more and so it's ever changing so yeah you can't blame the Cairo or the doctors or whomever you go to see because they're going based off of what you know what they learned and what they're learning and you know as they say they're practicing medicine and people oftentimes give them a bad rap for that but things are always evolving into new technology and new diagnosis and things. And we learn and, you know, it's like, we don't know it all. And so we got to constantly learn and educate ourselves. And so that's why I think your podcast along with so many others is, is so helpful Brody, because, you know, you learn more by listening and, and hearing, and then you can judge for yourself, right? You, you educate yourself just because we listen to what your podcast says doesn't mean it's, it's totally accurate. You listen to it. You take it with a grain of salt. Same with mine and anybody else. And you educate yourself. And just like those those classes that you took at uni, you take it with a grain of salt. You learn. You put it in your mind, and then you you take it, and then you go on and you you read the next book or you read the next ebook or listen to the next podcast. And it's constantly moving and changing. And that's why it's like you know we talked earlier stuff that I did when I was in high school and college for running. We didn't have all the technology and all the, you know, um, awesome stuff that we have now with, with our, you know, GPS watches and things like that. And their smartphones with the different apps and measuring power and measuring your, your gait and your cadence and all these different things. It's like, man, if I would have had this stuff 20 years ago, I would have been a much better runner. Well, I don't know for sure, but um, I definitely am more educated now um, having that access and that information at my fingertips definitely makes me a more educated runner now and i think that's um one of the things um like in your ebook lesson four you know sleep on it give it 24 hours you know you should give everything 24 hours before making a, a, a decision because you know what maybe it's just something that flared up and after 24 hours it's it's fine right you give it some time and so um don't jump to don't jump to rash conclusions or 
react to things drastically like oh my gosh i'm i'm dying here and my body's falling apart um, <laughs> but you know even like last week my daughter wasn't feeling well and she was real tempted to go to the urgent care well she gave it 24 hours and the next day she was feeling better i was like you know what save some money you save some time you gave your body some time to rest and you were able to sleep it off and you recovered and so but yeah i definitely encourage the listeners and those watching that you know Educate yourself. That's the important thing is um, that's one of the things I, I know Brody's passionate about is education and making sure people are educating and being able to make a decision for themselves rather than somebody else making it for them. And so um, Brody, what's, what's the, e, what, what is the um, best way for someone to check out your information? Yeah. So I always encourage those who want to learn about me like the first go-to would usually be the podcast so they can search the run smarter podcast wherever they're listening now um that, that's usually the first go-to you can join the facebook group i have a podcast facebook group as well i'm most active on instagram which would be uh, run smarter series is the handle and i do post a lot of research there and a lot of my blogs go onto there and most people tend to either direct message me on facebook messenger or on instagram um, so i recommend you go there if you wanted to if you're not much on social media i do have a website uh, runsmarter.online is the website which contains all the podcast episodes all the blogs um, also a couple of online courses that i have for runners and yeah, I, th I think that's enough for, for people. But the first thing, the first um, point of call that I like to have for runners is to keep it nice and simple is listen to the podcast, but listen back at episode one and then just work your way through the first 10. Can't beat that. Great information. Well, Brody, I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing sharing what you did with me. It it's definitely helps me to, to become more educated and self-aware of stuff as my own body and running, as well as those that are listening and great to hear um, the mind of another runner as well as somebody else that's gone through and, and learned so much and so such a wealth of knowledge and i definitely will continue to check out your information on your podcast and and your ebook it's it's definitely a good read and i enjoyed it so i appreciate you uh, sending that to me that is is fun and and educational at the same time so that makes it a good mix but um yeah absolutely brody thank you so much for joining me today and um We'll stay in touch on social media and, you know, take care over there in Australia, mate. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Andy. I had a lot of fun. Absolutely. Once again, Brody Sharp, everybody. Thank you, Brody. Have a great afternoon. Great evening. Thanks, mate. All right. Take care. You've been listening to the Scarecrow Runner podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's episode and that you'll join me next week as we journey down the trail for more adventures. Until then, have a blessed week. This is the Scarecrow Runner signing out.